Played, a podcast for couples looking for the perfect cooperative game. I'm Bailey. And I'm Rob. And each episode, we explore a new or nostalgic cooperative game to help you pick out what to play on game night. And we offer tips to make your game nights more special with creative pairings. This is later than we had planned to record this episode. Yeah, unlike Wizards, we are sometimes late. Goodness gracious. We had a week. (laughs) We actually were on top of being able to get a lot of these pieces together. And then all of a sudden, all of our time was eaten up by important but incredibly time-consuming tasks. Yeah, when cars are involved and you have to get them to the shop and all that kind of stuff, and it changes your whole logistics for the week, suddenly a regular workday, you've added an extra hours or two worth of chores and things that you need to take care of, doesn't leave a lot of time for playing games and sitting down and recording a podcast. Especially when, when you bring the car home and you think what was broken was fixed, and you discover that it wasn't, which means you have to make a return trip to the repair shop, work that into your schedule, then realize one of you is without a car, oh yeah, and also have to be available to meet plumbers coming to your house because one of your toilets hasn't been working for a month. Again, really grateful that they came. It's fixed now, but it's just something else to work into your week. Yep, glad that is over. Glad we are uh, getting ready to sit down and record our episode on this. Um, And apologies to all of you listeners out there for being a little bit behind this week. We hope you guys understand. So, even though we've had kind of a crazy week, I am coming off of a week of break, and we have had, prior to this crazy week, some time to play games. So... Uh, Bailey, what have you been playing when we are not playing games together or driving back and forth to the car repair shop? This might be cheating because you technically were there for this, but so were other people. Uh, We got the chance to host Rob's really childhood friends. Uh, We haven't seen them in a couple of years. They came down to our new home and we introduced them to lovers in a dangerous space time. If you folks are joining our show because you are Throne of Glass fans or you're just listening to our recent episodes, we do have an episode on lovers in a dangerous space time, the cooperative uh, cutesy kind of space control game, um, which we usually play, just the two of us, but it was great to be able to play with four people. We've always said that it's, we think it's more fun. The more folks you have, the more ground in your ship to cover. So a lot of fun introducing them to that game. They got really into it and spreading the love. Uh, And then we also performed, you know, a, a very valuable service for them. They've been working their way through Mario Party, trying to unlock every character in the Switch. And so we helped them with one of the river rafting levels that you're supposed to do to eventually unlock Donkey Kong. We didn't get to unlock Donkey Kong, but I think we helped them get there. Quick plug for that uh, mini game in Mario Party because it is cooperative, which I've never really thought about before. Mario Party, I know you in previous versions you used to be able to do teams, but this the river rafting mini game on the Mario Party on the Switch is all four of you guys really working as a team the whole way through. So uh, it was a a fun little addition that I had not messed around with before. You're totally right. I'm so used to playing the story mode and maybe you will be paired off in teams sometimes with the, um, the computer as one of your teammates. But this, not only the in-game act of rowing your river raft down the rapids, but the mini games are cooperative as well, which was a fun change of pace and maybe something we'll look into in a future episode. Yeah. What about you? Um, let's see, on the tail end of my break, I reinstalled Oblivion to mess around with uh, modding it a little bit, trying to set it up, and I think I spent more time getting the mod set up and working than playing. It was kind of a frustrating afternoon, some things just weren't working out, Uh, so eventually I pivoted and uh, got my fantasy fill, or my role-playing game fill, from a different game that I've played before as well, Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. I I started a new file on that. I've never beaten it before, who knows, this might be the time, I've been saying that a lot on this show, and then falling off of games, um, given the general craziness of things, but who knows, this could be the time. Uh, And outside of that, you have been watching me play a game called Ni no Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch. This has been so great! Yeah, it's been really, really fun. Uh, It's a game that was on my radar for a long time because of the Studio Ghibli art style, and... uh, 
sitting down and playing the first little bit of it with you watching and seeing how into the story and the artwork that you were, uh, I think this is going to be one that we stick with for quite a while. I think it's funny to note as we're, as I was watching this game and we're starting to play, we keep thinking, man, this really does look inspired by Studio Ghibli. And that's because it is. Right. It actually is the studio that did the illustrations or the artwork for the game. So not just inspired by, actually is that, uh, that production company. Which is really cool because it not only reminds you of those movies, but the game itself is a blend of video game and and cartoon movie that you'd want to watch. So as we explore games that can be enjoyed by somebody being an active as well as passive uh, player in that co-op team, it could be a, a really cool one to look into. Agreed. And I know it also has a sequel, so if we get really into this one and uh, need more Nino Kuni in our lives, then we can always pick up the second one as well. But outside of that, we have been carving what little time we have left for game playing out to play our game for today, which is a board slash card game called Embers of Memory, a Throne of Glass game, uh, which was published by Osprey Games in 2019. And you are the one who has really picked up and ran with the uh, series that this goes along with. So I will let you do the uh, synopsis. Definitely. Um, so we'll get more insight into why my synopsis might be more incomplete uh, in a second. But in this game, uh, at least one of the players is playing as Aelin, the game's main character. She's been captured, and it's intentional that you don't know much about what uh, her background because she has lost her memory. Her memory is being clouded by some negative forces, demons in particular. And as you progress through the game as Aelin and then a series of, of helper players to reclaim her identity, steal her resolve, and really triumph over the antagonists of the series. Is that vague? Yes, I'm being very intentional. Um, this game, we would learn, takes place during the final book, the, I guess, seventh in the series, eighth overall, if you include the prequel, of Sarah J. Mass? Moss's uh, Throne of Glass series. I had no idea this was a book series. I just grabbed this game off of the Target shelf when I was there a couple months ago. I always like to look to see if there's something cooperative. This said it was. It looked pretty interesting. It was totally an impulse buy. Little did I know there is a vast, incredibly popular book series uh, upon which the game is based. Uh, and so we're going to do our best not to have any spoilers for the book series because I've been trying to preserve those for myself. At the time that we started playing, I had read zero of the books. At this point, I have finished the first novel, uh, A Throne of Glass. I have just started the prequel, The Assassin's Blade is its title, and I did buy the entire boxed collection, so I will be getting there. Uh, and because this game takes place in the final book, um, as we've been playing, I've been trying to cover up some of the, the lore and the uh, plot points so that I don't ruin it for myself, and we'll do that for you too. You know, we could always just wait to play more until you finish the series. Yeah, I think that's probably going to be the best route for now. I wanted to test it out, see if I was going to be hooked, and I obviously was. One giant Amazon pur purchase later, I'm very excited. So while researching this game, because I was likewise in the dark about both the book series and this game itself, uh, I learned something interesting about this game. It is, I guess, what you would call a re-implementation of another game, hmm. which I'm probably going to butcher how this is pronounced. It's a Japanese game, and I'm not quite sure how, uh, how to say this correctly. But the game that this is a re-implementation of is called Ravens of Thry Sahashri, I believe is how you would say that. Um, and as I understand it, this game actually has basically the same rules as Ravens of Thry Sahashri, just the theming and artwork has changed. I believe this game gets a little bit of a boost over the original or the other implementation of the rule set because this includes the campaign system of oh, okay. changing things over time, giving you different powers instead of just the the same kind of limited communication co-op puzzle each time. So this is a game based upon another game, and it is also based upon a young adult book series. Correct. 
many layers here. So exciting. Yeah. Uh, I had, I've never really seen a game that just uses the rule set from something else and changes the skin of it. I think it's a cool way to bring... Monopoly. Monopoly does that all the time. But no, well, no, because it's, then it's just Monopoly. It's still Monopoly, you've just changed the thing of it, but like... Friends Monopoly, Pokemon Monopoly. No, I know, I get, I get what you're saying, but this one is not, it, it's not called Ravens of Thrice, a Hashri, colon, a Throne of Glass game. Got it. It's changing the actual branding of it. There's no way that you, just opening the box, you would know that this is actually a real implementation of the other game. It's something that I had to look up. Whereas Monopoly, you know right away that it's all still the big boring game of Monopoly. More fun to look at the board and your cards than actually is to play, is our opinion. <laughs> if you are someone who's very good at Monopoly, you would easily win over us. Yeah. So with that, let's dive into talking about Embers of Memory, a Throne of Glass game, or just Embers of Memory for short. Uh, I mentioned this already, but I do want to hammer home again. One of the most prominent elements to this game is the fact that it is based upon a young adult book series. The game is organized into chapters and progresses through the course of that book. If I could compare the series from what I have experienced from the first book and the little bits that you get from the game, the closest thing that I can liken it to would be the Wicked Lovely series by Melissa Marr. It's another series that I love. It's uh, high fantasy but that book series takes place in contemporary day uh, with fae and fairy courts, whereas the Throne of Glass books are very much in a fantasy world. The cover basically says, you know, if Hunger Games met Game of Thrones and fans of those series would like them. I see what they're doing with that. But yes, you're very much in a, a young adult world, but certainly some uh, adult themes come through the series and what we've seen in the, in the card game so far. Yeah, the artwork and the uh, the way that the story, or the snippets of the story that we've read so far, uh, it doesn't seem necessarily like it's aimed just at, uh, like, at teenage readers. Yeah, torture isn't always in every young adult book series, and it clearly is here. <laughs> no, but torture, yes, a, a torture scene is kind of the uh, backdrop of this game and why the mechanics are what they are. The core gameplay, at least on one person's end, because both players have kind of different roles, is a puzzle matching game, but based on, uh, but the matches that you can make are based on what parts of memories you're able to recall. So you're limited in the way that you, one player is limited in the way that they can play down cards onto the mind, I believe, is like the playing field. Yes. Uh, based on the picture and which parts of that picture on the card are blocked versus revealed or recalled. It's a really neat little system and you do have to kind of tinker with cards a little bit to make sure that you can play them or that if you do play it there, there's continued moves that you can make. I know when we were learning the game, I did make a couple plays where I put a card down and then would later come to realize, oh, because I put it down in this orientation with these cards overlapping, I'll never be able to make the matches that I need. So it's not super complicated, uh, but it is a unique system. Uh, I've never really seen anything like it before, obviously not having played the original implementation of it. It reminded me almost of, granted I've never played this the real way beyond setting them up to knock them down, but as I've watched folks play dominoes before and manipulating the tiles to align or not align, and you're making these intricate, almost crossword puzzle-esque designs across the table, that is what your table ends up looking like in one portion. Uh, but then you also have the resolve. The mind is your main playing field, and then the resolve is almost like a bank of memories that get unlocked throughout the course of your play. And each character kind of takes over one side of that, of that invisible board. Again, at least in as far as we have experienced of the game since we are early in the campaign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is interesting to see or to think about we don't really know how that's going to continue to change throughout the game. And also, we each only played one portion of it. We stuck kind of in our specialty area. The game does allow you to switch back and forth if you want to switch which part of the, the team role you're doing. Uh, but I kind of was drawn to, towards the spatial puzzling aspect of it. And I think, uh, not to speak for you, but it seemed like you were also well-equipped to do that kind of reactive or, like, long-term planning of 
taking what was given in the mind and making sure that it goes to the right spot or um, within the, the way that the rules allow you to have limited communication, you were very on top of trying to give me as much feedback as possible. As I've learned by doing Clifton strengths to work, my number one strength in the top five is a ranger, which is being able to be <laughs> highly uh, you know, flexible and adaptable and pivoting on a dime to what is there in front of me. Uh, and I think that played out <laughs> in this game as well, not doing the initial setup, but interpreting uh, the mind as it was laid before me and being able to work through the steps um, that I had aligned for myself. So in this breakdown, I was playing as Aelin, who is having her memories warped, twisted, and trying to uh, make connections that were being fed to her by negative but also positive forces. Um, Rob was playing in this round as Fenris, who was a helpful wolf, I believe. Mm -hmm. Haven't met him yet in the book series, so I really can't speak to anything there. But um, it was interesting to each have our own specific roles and working through rule sets that were particular to us, but they are very much linked with one another and you don't succeed until both of you are, you know, are working in concert together. The limited communication in this really, um, it doesn't seem like a big deal because there's almost not that much information that you, you would want to communicate outside of certain circumstances. I'm kind of working on my thing. You're kind of working on your thing. It just so happens that to do your thing, you're taking from the cards that I'm putting down anyway. We actually were playing this while watching some preseason football games on in the background, and it was nice that I could kind of take my turn and then look back up at the TV while you took your turn, but we were all still working on the same goal, even though we were kind of playing it almost as a solitaire type game and making decisions about which cards to play and which cards to take on our own. So let's talk a little bit about limited communication, because this is not our first limited communication game, or even card game, that we have covered on this show. We've also played The Crew, where communication is absolutely um, impacted and limited in a few different ways. Let's kind of compare and contrast. What are you thinking here? I would say that The Crew, the, you feel the limited communication a lot more because the depth of strategy needed to succeed at every mission, especially as you get further into the campaign book for The Crew, is so much more complex. You need to make sure that the right numbers, the right suits are being played, the trump cards are being saved for the important moments, then you're dealing with all the other things that the campaign scenarios throw at you in the crew, like jammed communications or shuffling of cards through different people's hands and uh, not being able to say like, oh, we need to make sure this color and this number are played really does hamstring you. Um, whereas this game, you as the the reacting player is always you're always going to have something in your toolbox regardless of what i play even if it's not the most optimal or uh the most helpful every time we're not going to just crash and burn because i can't because you can't tell me exactly what you need right granted again we have not gone that far into the game and i know the rules do become more complex with subsequent chapters so it might become more of an issue later but at least where i've seen it play out um, in what we have seen so far in the resolve, which is your the bank of cards that Aelin has control over, four of them start face down, and, and she is allowed to look at these. That player is allowed to look at them, which I did repeatedly because I had to keep remembering what they were, but I can't communicate those to Rob. Um, but you are learning, starting to get hints of what those might be based upon my actions when I take cards from you. So you actually can learn a, a lot by watching the other person. And I agree, you have more visually av available to look at, whereas the crew, so much of your hands and everything are, are hidden. And I remember when we were learning the crew, granted it was our first limited communication game, we had a lot of rounds where we played with communication and with our hands open to each other to make sure that we were playing the game correctly, learning the rules, and, and making smart moves, or at least being learning how to infer from one another how to make smart moves. For this game, I think maybe we played one round with communicating to make sure that we were on the same page and everyone was understanding the rules, but after that, we didn't really need it. Um, there were certain points where I would throw my hands up and say, I think we lost this round, and that would be our communication. But uh, yeah, it just didn't, it didn't seem as necessary. Like you said, though, there's still lots, uh, lots left in our campaign deck, so it's possible that we are 
being a little too cocky, and the game is going to throw some more curveballs at us as we get further. I do, I do also like that uh, the limited communication isn't there necessarily just as a gimmick to make the game harder. It does fit the theme of the game. The characters in the game, Aelin and Fenris, are actually engaged in a situation where they themselves have limited communication. They're held captive. Yeah, there's yeah. captivity. Um, Aelin is being tortured under her, uh, or by her demonic captors, and they're, they are purposely trying to remove her memories, and Fenris can't talk, I'm assuming, because he's a wolf, although it is a fantasy book, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but he is trying to help without being able to communicate either, just by sharing pieces of memory or holding on to pieces of the memory for Aelin so that she doesn't completely let go. Uh, so it's interesting, much in the same way as the crew, where you were in space and would have limited communication, there's a reason for the limited communication here. It's not just uh, covering up design flaws. We probably mentioned this in the crew, but limited communication can make cooperative games a little less newcomer friendly. Not being able to guide players new to the genre or new to the idea of working together in a board game, uh, it might leave them feeling left out or feeling uncomfortable using all the tools that they do have at their disposal because no one is able to explain the overall strategy to them. So while this game does have relatively simple rules and relatively simple systems at the start, it might not be the best uh, jumping in point for people new to co-op gaming unless they're just huge Thrones of Glass fans. You could also interpret newcomer as newcomer to the series <laughs> um, when you think about that question. Uh, we certainly were, and until I picked up the book, I don't think we were getting as much out of the game as we could if we really knew the full story arc or even who the characters were. Um, but since I am reading these, I'm excited to see how much more it's going to be interesting to me and, and how much I will be getting out of it being more familiar with the world. That said, if you honestly don't care, you have no interest in reading the books, but you kind of want to play out this game for what it sounds like, I think you could absolutely do it, but I think there's more in store for those who know the world. The campaign deck does provide some level of exposition. Most of it went over my head because I don't know the characters of the world or anything, uh, but it would be doable. With our limited exposure to this game uh, and the, the relative simplicity of the systems that's really the meat and potatoes that we we need to share for for covering the game so why don't we get to uh our our thoughts and opinions again keeping in mind our limited exposure of only playing a uh, a couple chapters in to the campaign so bailey what did you think did oh man there needs to be a shorter way to say the name of this game embers of memory colon a throne of glass game work for you yes so far it has. Um, I think recalling what I like out of cooperative games in general, I'm obviously going to be drawn to games, especially board games that have high quality artwork um, and yet being familiar with the characters of the book, the game definitely draws you in with the portrait cards of the characters, which really are your deck. I think we could have to be specific, your cards in the deck have character names on them in addition to having these blocked and unblocked pieces and each having a suit like a traditional deck of cards. And so you're looking at these really nicely produced um, fantasy character portraits which add to the overall tone of the game. I also really like the defined roles that you have. It is cooperative, obviously. You're working towards one shared goal. Um, but I feel like when I when I play cooperative games, and maybe, I don't know if this means less now that we have all this experience <laughs> at this point playing things together, but at least early in my gaming time, I would like to get more out of things when I felt like I was making a, a positive contribution to the team. Maybe that stemmed from being the person that came to this with less overall experience. I don't want to feel like I'm being carried don't make me your survivor goat at the end just so that you can win. Um, but I think with having the clearly defined roles of this game, it allows both people to, on at least the very surface level, have a set of rules that are their rules, that they learn, that they follow, that are contributing to the whole, but allows you to get more into the actual role-playing element of this. I don't know that I would classify it as a role-playing game, but 
people are taking on characters. The, the narrative is woven into this card game and it allows you, especially if you're not sw switching out characters, to play the story in a way that is more abstract than let's say the Princess Bride adventure book game where you are literally marching through the scenes of the story. And perhaps most obvious of all, this works for me because it got me out of my reading slump. I haven't <laughs> read a book in a while. Uh, spent a lot of my time playing games for some reason. Uh, but, <laughs> but I am a big fan uh, of young adult fiction, especially young adult fantasy. Um, and so as soon as I learned that's where this series lived and that it is a beloved one of one of my very good friends, it got her stamp of approval. Shout out to Rin again, the person who recommended Moon Hunters to us. I knew that there's clearly some quality here. So thank you to Target for having it in stock. And thank you to myself for being incredibly impulsive that day. <laughs> yes, thank you both. <laughs> what about you? Uh, not to step on your toes, but I also really enjoyed the artwork for this game. Um, the images and portraits that are included both of the, the the i'm assuming the allies that you're trying to keep the memories of and the demons who are kind of clouding my deck of cards that i have are both really well done very simplistic but very uh very impactful yeah and the the colors for the suits are very rich and i think it just gives a very almost like regal mystique i think is what i'm gonna go with because it makes it sound like i know what i'm talking about um, you took some sort of art history class in college. I remember you had to memorize a bunch of paintings and authors. I helped you with some sort of digital flashcard thing back when we were freshmen. Yeah, I don't think that's going to really help me here. But the, comp <laughs> the components are very well done, I think. The cards have a nice heft to them, and the, the artwork, I think, probably fits the source material pretty well, uh, given my limited understanding of the series. Um, so I, I just think that there's a clear passion for this series put into the components. It's not just a cash grab. Um, and like I mentioned, the kind of solitaire or individualized roles uh, really worked for me. Being able to special or being able to focus in on my specialty role, which happened to be the spatial numeric puzzling aspect that kind of fueled our uh, team effort going forward. So um, it was definitely interesting, having never played anything like this, I think it is definitely worth uh, checking out again once we are able to be spoiler-free when you have read through the next six books or whatever it is. I've got a ways ahead of me, but I am definitely invested. Awesome. Well, it sounds like we will be revisiting this one then. Uh, for you listeners out there, if this sounds intriguing, or if you're a Throne of Glass fan already and you want to... Uh, Maybe check out this game just to have something else on your shelf besides the lovely box set, which I feel like we should just get some, like, Amazon link set up so that when you guys all go buy the box set, we get a kickback. But I don't know <laughs> how to do that, so we're not going to have that. <laughs> you might like this game if uh, you're looking for something that has a progressive complexity. It does have a very simple tutorial at the start to show you how the puzzling system works to show you how the resolve building system works, and then it starts throwing you into the chapters where you're putting both systems together. Uh, and we can only assume that it gets more complicated from there. You'll also like this game if you are into campaigns as far as your board gaming goes. The game allows you to take your time. This is not something I would imagine you would sit down and finish in an evening. Um, it's something that, like the crew, you come back to over time and would be best for folks who are able to play with a dedicated player two over time rather than uh, fits and starts. And finally, uh, you will have to be at least somewhat interested in or tolerable. tolerable? You have to be tolerable as a person. <laughs> or, or tolerant of is what I was trying to say. Hopefully you are also tolerable. We don't want you to be intolerable. All of our listeners are very nice people, I'm sure. <laughs> Anyway, the point of that was you have to t be able to tolerate limited communication. If not being able to talk to your partner um, is a deal breaker, then don't pick this up because I think any implementation where you do have open communication does kind of muck up the, the systems that are set in place a little bit. And finally, uh, if you are looking for a game to play by yourself, 
don't get this one. Uh, it does not work solo. The main systems in the game do require that uh, each player is lacking information that the other player has. So it will not work solo, um, unfortunately. Gotta have a buddy for Embers of Memory. Yep. Or Split Personality. That might work too. What about for our uh, date night recommendations? What kind of things do you think people should pair with Embers of Memory, colon, a Throne of Glass game? Mine's real easy. Yeah, I know. I saw this in our notes, and uh, I think it's kind of cheating. Read the books. Read the books. That's what I'm doing myself. I think you'll get more out of it. I intend to get more out of it by actually knowing the world and the characters. Um, there are eight books in total, and since the game takes place during the action of the final book, you kind of need a lot of the other ones to really get going. So that's mine. I took the easy one this week. What about you? Uh, well, first I'm just thinking that we should be doing some sort of read-aloud scenarios that I can also absorb all this. So um, get your, your voices ready, your voice acting ready, because you're going to be doing some, some read-aloud. I would love to. <laughs> um, for my recommendation, I'm also going to cheat a little bit, but I'm just going to try and highlight the one of the advantages that we found in this game. Um, as I mentioned, we were able to play this while also paying loose attention to some preseason football. So my recommendation is to play this while watching or listening to something else with your partner, whether that is preseason football like us, soon to be regular season football, and more of our time and evenings will be taken up by uh, at least me checking the TV and my fantasy football scores and uh, less time spent gaming. Having an option like this that allows you to split your attention fairly will, will be good. Or I am also playing fantasy football. I object to the omission that I will not also be doing these things. All I was trying to say is that you're a little less glued to it than I am, which, is a, which is a good thing. <laughs> uh, if you're not into football or fantasy football and you're still looking for something to do or listen to while playing this game, might I suggest a podcast called Hours Played, where what? people co cover cooperative games and give creative pairings. Um, it would be a great thing to play this while catching up on our backlog, especially if you want to check out other board games that uh, you might want to add to your co-op collection, or, as we mentioned, The Crew, if you're looking for another limited communication game. And while it's not out yet, if you are going to listen to our podcast while playing Embers of Memory, colon, A Throne of Glass Game, uh, keep an eye out for our next episode that will be coming out, which is a very special hours played anniversary episode. We looked at the calendar and realized we've been doing this for roughly a year plus now, and uh, we're going to put out some special content. Not quite sure what it's going to look like yet, but it will be all related to the fact that we have been uh, spending a lot of time and money playing, buying, and talking about cooperative games in the last year. It's pretty unbelievable, right? That we're coming up on a year. We published September... 7th of 2020, you know, almost exactly six months into a, a new world <laughs> within the pandemic. And here we are coming up on a year. It's time to celebrate a project that we've actually stuck with for a year and, and look forward to, to year two of the show. And so if you've been enjoying our show thus far, we would love to hear from you. You can rate and leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. To stay up to date with the show, talk to us about what we've been playing, or even suggest a new game for us to try, we encourage you to follow the show and connect with us on Twitter and Instagram at at hours played, and also join our Discord server to chat with us directly, which the link to which is included in the show notes. Thanks for listening to Hours Played, and happy co oping Thanks to Kevin McLeod for the use of our theme song, BitQuest. You can find more of his music at incompetech.com.